All right, folks, this short video lecture is going to cover the end of section 1.5 and all of section 1.6, both of which deal with continuity. Go back over some of the main definitions we discussed in class. So we first talked about what it takes to make a function continuous at a point, and we came up with three conditions. The first of which is that f of c exists, or another way of phrasing that is that f of c is defined that the limit as x approaches c exists, and that those two things agree, so that the limit and the function value at c are the same. Once we talked about and agreed upon a definition for continuity at a point, we moved on to a discussion of what it takes to make f continuous on an interval, so on a, an interval of points, which can be either open or closed. And so on an open interval, we said that f is continuous provided that it's continuous for every point in the open interval. For a closed interval, the definition gets a little bit trickier because when you include the end point, like when you're at A, you can't go to the left of A, so you can't really ask about the limit at A. We just modified the definition a little bit. We said that F should be continuous on the open interval from A to B, right continuous at A, and left continuous at B. Now to fill in some of the mathier notation, what that means is that the right-hand limit at A matches F of A, and that the left-hand limit at B matches F of B. Let's look at some examples now. We'll start with a visual example. So what's about to appear is the graph of a function F of X, and we're going to try to determine the intervals on which the function is continuous and why it has discontinuities at the points where it has discontinuities. So here's our graph, sort of a weird graph but not dissimilar from the ones we've been using in class as examples. We should immediately notice three points of importance. One is x equals negative 2, something's going wrong there. x equals 1, something's up there. And x equals 2, the asymptote is an indication that something important is happening there. At this point, maybe hit pause and think about where the function is discontinuous and why, and then from that information from the graph, can you then identify the intervals on which the function's continuous? What you should have found, or should have decided, is that the function is continuous from minus infinity to minus 2, including negative 2, because at negative 2, looking at the graph, it's closed, it's filled in as we move in from the left, so the limit and the function value agree. From minus 2 to 1, it's continuous, but open, because both of those dots are open on the endpoints there. From 1 to 2, same reasoning. And then from 2 to infinity, again, we never include infinity, so that's always open. And at 2, since the function approaches that vertical asymptote, it never actually gets to 2. And so we want to say that it's open from 2 to infinity. In terms of why we have discontinuities, at minus 2, we've got a jump discontinuity. The right and left limits don't agree. At 1, we have what's called a removable discontinuity, and this is where it's like you just plucked a point out, basically, from the graph. And sometimes that point is just placed elsewhere, sometimes it's taken away altogether. And at 2, it's an infinite discontinuity for, I think, obvious reasons. The function goes to infinity from one side and or the other side. Now, in addition to having a good intuitive sense about what continuity means, when you're given a graph, we also want to be able to do all that kind of work algebraically. So this is one of the trickier problems from the homework, where you're given this weird piecewise function, but you're not given all the information. So there are these constants a and b, and our goal is to try to figure out if we can make the function continuous everywhere by picking a correct a and a correct b. What we should first notice is that each piece of this graph is a continuous function, like no matter what I pick for a, 2x plus 8a is a line, and lines are continuous everywhere. Same thing you can say for the ax plus b, same thing for the parabola, the third function, which is a parabola. Uh, no matter what number I pick for b, I'm going to end up with a parabola, and that's continuous everywhere. So the trick then is to figure out what values we need to set a and b to, so that the transition points, the points x equals minus 2 and x equals 2, also give you a continuous function or satisfy the definition for continuity at a point. Well, let's start with x equals minus 2. So we want to check again, 
function exists, limit exists, those two things agree. So let's see what happens. For the function, you plug in minus 2, you get something, right? You get 8a minus 4, which is a number. Regardless of what I plug in for a, I'm going to end up with a number. And then for the limit, if the limit exists, that means the right and left-hand limits agree, right? So we can look at the left-hand limit. And for the left-hand limit, we want to look to the left of minus 2. Well, to the left of minus 2 is 2x plus 8a. So you're going to take 2x plus 8a, plug in minus 2, and you get, uh, again, 8a minus 4. For the right-hand limit, we're going a little to the right of minus 2, or I should say immediately to the right of minus 2, which is the second function, ax plus b. So you plug in, you get minus 2a plus b. Okay, so those are the right and left-hand limits and the function value. All of that stuff's in terms of a and b still. As we go through, we'll get closer and closer to figuring out how to actually set those two values. Let's look then at what happens at x is equal to 2. Sorry, there's a typo there. It's supposed to say x is equal to 2. We want to look again at the function value. So you plug in 2, you get 2a plus b. That's fine. You look to the left of 2. Now to the left of 2 is that second function, ax plus b. So again, we plug in 2, we get 2a plus b. To the right of 2, we have the parabola. We're going to plug in 2 there, and we get 4 minus 2b. And so what we need is that the right and left-hand limits that we found, both looking at x equals 2 and x equals negative 2, that those right and left-hand limits match. And so what we end up with is two equations. We end up with 8a minus 4 is minus 2a plus b. That's from the previous slide, the right and left-hand limits at minus 2. And 2a plus b has to equal 4 minus 2b because we want the right and left-hand limits at 2 to match. Okay, so now this is like an Algebra 2 problem. We're going to work our way through, get a and b both on the same side. This, again, might be a good time to hit pause, work through this algebra by yourself to make sure it all makes sense, and then come back and uh, follow along here. So... You can solve these types of things however you want. You can use substitution or elimination. I'm going to use elimination. So I'll take the second equation, multiply by minus 5. And now when I add the two equations, I end up with minus 16b equals minus 16. And that means b has to equal 1. Once I know that, I can take that and plug it back into one of the equations. And if I plug it into, which one did I pick? 2a plus 3b equals 4. I end up with a is equal to a half. So there we go. Two values, a and b. If we take those and plug them back into that piecewise function, we should find that everything matches up. And if you want to take the time just for practice to maybe graph that, you'll find that the function meets at all the points. You can draw the whole thing without picking up your pen or pencil. The next section, so 1.6, now deals with the continuity of trig functions. And without getting into too much detail on proving this stuff, it's a fact that both sine of x and cosine of x are continuous for all real numbers. And if you just think about the graphs of those, there's the graph of sine, there's the graph of cosine. You can't actually draw them without picking up your pen or pencil because they go on forever, of course, but they can go on forever without ever having to uh, pick up your pen, pencil, chalk, whatever. And so what that means is that uh, the limit for sine at a particular point is the same as the function value. The limit for cosine is the same as the function value. And that results from our definition for continuity, right? If a function is continuous, the function value matches the limit. Okay, it seems like a really obvious fact, right? Let's look at some examples. So consider the limit of cosine of this messy looking rational function as x goes to infinity. What the aforementioned properties tell us is that you can just take the limit of what's inside cosine and plug that in and that becomes your answer. Okay, so in this case we would get cosine of 3 over negative 5. For something a little more complicated like sine of e to the 1 over x, we can do the same kind of substitution tricks that we did before, right? So put the limit inside the sine because again, that's what continuity tells us we're allowed to do. 
and then we'll make a substitution like I think we did a similar problem in class let t equal that 1 over x as x goes to 0 from the left t goes to minus infinity plug that in and you end up with uh, sine of 0 which is 0 okay um, if any of these problems seem a little tricky to you maybe rewind hit pause work through them yourself and see if you, what you come up with okay now how about the limit as x goes to plus infinity for sine of x. So think about the graph. What happens as you move all the way to the right? Well, as x goes to infinity, sine of x continues to oscillate forever between minus 1 and 1. So the limit does not exist. There's no value that we can say, I can go far enough to the right and get as close to that number as I want, because I'm always going to be moving away from any number I choose. And the same can be said for cosine of x. Okay, now here's a curious limit. The limit is x goes to 0 of sine x over x. So we said in class a bunch of times, when you're taking limits, you want to worry about what happens when you get division by 0, so 0 in the denominator. And in this case, if I plug in 0, I get 0 over 0. So what that tells me is that something is up. I can do some kind of simplifying, some sort of algebraic trickery or something to figure out what that limit is. And if you look at the graph, so there's the graph of sine x over x. At x is equal to 0, it looks like I'm landing on 1, right? Now, graphs aren't super reliable, so I can't conclude necessarily from the picture that the, that the answer is 1. But we have a sense now that that's what the answer should be. So what's going to follow is a kind of neat little proof using some trig and some geometry that you're familiar with from the past to prove to ourselves that that's the answer. And the proof isn't something that you're going to have to commit to memory, but I think it's a good thing to see at least once. So we're going to start by graphing the unit circle and drawing a couple of lines. So there's my unit circle. I'm going to draw a ray out from the origin, and then I'm going to draw two vertical lines. One that's uh, vertical coming up from the x-axis that hits that point of intersection and one that's tangent to the circle on the right-hand side. Okay, so if you look at what I have going on there, there are three shapes. So inside the circle, there's a right triangle. From the ray to the circle and the to the x-axis, we get a wedge, so a piece of the circle called a sector. And then from the ray to the tangent line and the x-axis, we get a bigger right triangle. And if you just take a moment to think about it, no matter where I were to draw that ray in the first quadrant, I would have exactly these three shapes, and they would be one smaller than the other in the same arrangement. Okay, so for the inside circle, we know that the x value on the unit circle is given by cosine, the y value is given by sine. The fact that maybe you don't remember, I certainly didn't remember, but the first time I taught this class is that if you look at that vertical line that's tangent to the circle, where it intersects that ray, the y value there is tangent of theta. That's why tangent's called tangent. So using the fact that area of a right triangle or any triangle is one half base times height, we can write down the areas of these shapes. So we know that the area of the small one is going to be base times height cosine times sine over 2. The big triangle is tan theta. The base of it is 1, right, because it's going to the edge of the unit circle along the x-axis. So tan theta times 1 over 2. And now the other piece of geometry that's easy to forget if you haven't seen it in a while is that the area of a piece of the circle is how many radians divided by 2. Okay, makes sense, right, because if you go around the whole circle that's 2 pi radians, 2 pi over 2 is pi. And this, the area of a circle is pi r squared, in this case r is 1. So I'm going to do a little bit of algebra. We're going to divide each term by sine and multiply each term by 2. So take a minute, again hit pause, work through it, then hit play and make sure you get the same inequality I end up with here. So what I end up with is for the first one, cosine, for the middle one, theta over sine theta for the last one, 1 over cosine, because tangent is sine over cosine, right? So when I divide by sine, that goes away. Okay, so now 
In the middle, we've got theta over sine theta. It's sandwiched between the other two functions. And there's a theorem about situations like this called the sandwich theorem or the squeeze theorem. It says that if you've got three functions that are one smaller than the other, like we have in that previous slide, then when you take the limit for the outer two, if those two limits are the same, the middle limit has to match, which makes sense, right? So it gets the middle one is squeezed between the two functions. If they equal the same thing, the middle one equals the same thing. If we apply the sandwich theorem to what we have, well, take the limit as theta goes to zero for each piece, right? On the left-hand side and on the right-hand side, we get uh, cosine of zero, one over cosine of zero, both of which give us one. That means the limit of theta over sine theta has to be one as well, because theta over sine theta was, again, sandwiched between those two functions. So we conclude that our curious limit is equal to one. Now, I know this is the reciprocal, but it's typically the way it's written, is sine theta over theta. And of course, one over one is one, so we get the same thing. So now, how about some applications for that limit? We can take uh, previously limits that we couldn't evaluate. Now we can apply this funky limit of sine over sine theta over theta to solve some of these limits. For example, uh, one minus cosine x over x as x goes to zero. So notice that if you plug in zero, you get one minus one up top, which is zero. You get zero on the bottom. So there's some sort of trickery that we can do here, right? Uh, again, maybe hit pause here. Think about what sort of trickery might work and then come back. The trickery in this case is, as we've seen in a bunch of examples, multiplying by the conjugate. So if we take the top and bottom, multiplying both by one plus cosine of x, you end up with all this funky algebra. So again, this might be a good opportunity. Hit pause, cover your eyes, or go back a slide, and um, see if you can work this out for yourself. So you multiply the top by one plus cosine. You use the identity that one minus cosine squared is sine squared. Split the limit up into two limits. And then when you plug in zero, you get one for sine x over x. And you get zero over two for that second factor. And of course, one times zero is equal to zero. One more application of this. So let's take sine of 2x over sine of 3x as x goes to zero. Now, same deal. If you plug in zero, you get zero over zero. Now, here there's no x by itself, right? The 2x and the 3x are in a sign, so they're trapped in there. How are we going to use the limit we just came up with? Well, again, a little bit of trickery. The trickery here is multiply by 1 a few times. So what do I mean by that? Well, x over x is equal to 1, 2 over 2 is equal to 1, 3 over 3 is equal to 1. If I multiply by those factors, I haven't changed the limit, which is good. Then what I can do is move, shuffle all those terms around, right? Because right across the numerator, I've got a bunch of stuff being multiplied together. Same thing in the denominator. So take a minute and convince yourself that what I just did is okay. Hit pause, convince yourself that this is okay that I've taken the x and the 2, and I've shuffled them to be under the sine of 2x, the 3 and the x to be above the sine of 3x, and then what's left over is 3 over 2. Okay, so again, hit pause. Make sure that line 1 to line 2 makes sense to you. And what you'll find is then that if you take the limit as x goes to 0, that first limit, sine of 2x over x, well, in this case, 2x is like my theta. So sine theta over theta, theta is going to zero, you get one. Same for three x over sine of three x, right? Now in that for that limit, it's separate, but that's your theta, three x. So you've got theta over sine of three theta, or so, sorry, theta over sine of theta. And then what's left over is the three over two. So you end up with one times one times three over two is equal to three over two. Okay, and that's pretty much all there is to it. So we took those concepts of continuity looked at how we can apply them graphically and algebraically, and then applied them to trig functions, basically saying we should all agree that sine and cosine are continuous everywhere. What does that tell us? And then we came up with uh, a new property, essentially, this funky new limit, sine of theta over theta as theta goes to zero. So take a look at some of those homework problems. Um, if you have questions, we'll go over them in class, of course, and otherwise we'll move on to bigger and better things.